Step two in partial fraction decomposition will use that factor denominator. And the second step is to set up what I'll call the form of the partial fractions. And I'll show you what I mean with this example. In our example, we're gonna take one over x cubed plus two x squared plus x. And it turns out that this form the factored form of the denominator is x times x plus one squared. And the partial fractions, there's gonna be something divided by x, something divided by x plus one, and something divided by x plus one squared. And what we'll talk about here is how to recognize what the forms are gonna look like. But when I say the form of the partial fraction, we're using placeholders a, b, and c. We don't know what those values are yet but by investigating the factored form of this more complicated denominator, we can tell what the form is gonna be for each of the partial fractions. We can tell what partial fractions would combine if we were to get a common denominator and combine them to be this form here. So that's the process of step two here, is to figure out how that decomposition form emerges but it all is based on this factored form of the denominator, which is why we have to factor first in that first step. And once we get the factored form, we look closely at this and based on what we see, we'll write down different terms in our partial fraction setup. So let me show you how that works. There are three possibilities that you'll run across, at least in this class. So the first possibility is that when you look at these factors, what you find is that all of them are linear, meaning of the form x plus one, for instance, or even x, and they're all unique. There's no repeated factors. So when you write this out, really x times x plus one squared is x times x plus one times x plus one. So that's a repeated factor. That x plus one is not unique. So case one is not the case we have here, but for an example, let's say we did have one where when we factored it, we had two linear factors, x minus three and x plus five, and both of them are unique. There's no repeated factors. In that case, it's really simple. You're gonna have two partial fractions. One of them will have x minus three as the denominator. One of them will have x plus five. And you can think about how if you were combining those fractions, you would start by getting that common denominator by multiplying this first fraction by x plus five on the top and bottom and multiplying the second by x minus three on the top and the bottom. So you can kind of see where it comes from when you combine them, now we're moving in reverse and this will hold true when all of the factors are linear and there's no repetition. You can put one fraction for each of those factors and the numerators will be some constant value which we don't know yet, so we'll just call them a and b. And of course, step three is gonna be finding those values a and b. So that's the first case, the simplest case, is if all the factors are linear and they're all unique, each factor gets its own fraction, and then the numerators are the unknown constants which we'll find later on. The second case is like the one we started with, where we have all linear factors, but there's some repetition. So for example, x squared times x minus five times x plus four to the third. Notice that each of those factors is linear. Now there's one little caveat here this looks like a quadratic factor, x squared. But really, it's just a linear factor, x, that's repeated twice. So watch out for that. It can be a little bit tricky at first. But think carefully, that's just x times x times x minus five times x plus four, x plus four, x plus four. So those factors you could write out with the repetition that way instead of using these exponents. So these have repeated factors, but all of the factors on their own, if you just look at one copy, is a linear factor. 
For this one, each factor again gets its own denominator. So x is one of the factors. And there will also be a fraction for x squared. Then there will be one for x minus five. Then x plus four, x plus four squared, and x plus four cubed all need their own fractions. So if there's repetition to the factors, you need to account for the base factor and then every repetition of that up to however many you have. So if there's an x plus four cubed, you'll need an x plus four, x plus four squared, and x plus four cubed term in your partial fraction form. That's just to account for all the possibilities. Some of these values a through f might turn out to be zero when we go to solve for them. So it may be that all of these terms aren't actually needed, but when we're setting up the form, we have to account for all the possibilities to make sure that when we combine all of this, if we were to take this result and combine it, we would have all the pieces we need to simplify to this. And I know that sounds complicated at first, but as long as you remember the rule, it's not too bad to work with. The re repeated factors just need this repetition where you include all the powers from one up to however many you have, like this third power. And case two is the example that we were working with originally. We have one over x times x plus one squared. That has a single factor x and then a repeated factor x plus one. So x gets its own fraction, x plus one gets its own fraction, and x plus one squared gets its own fraction. So that's case two where there's repeated factors. Case three is where quadratic factors are included. So a quadratic factor would have the form ax squared plus bx plus c. And this would be a case where the quadratic factor could not be factored any further. So a quadratic term that couldn't be broken down into a product of two linear terms. If that's the case, then notice what we've done before. These partial fractions have a linear denominator and a constant numerator. The pattern continues if we have a quadratic denominator, we'll have a linear numerator. In other words, the power on the top, the order of the numerator, is always one lower than the order of the denominator. What we're not going to do is if you had a cubic factor, for instance, that was irreducible, you could have a cubic denominator and then a quadratic numerator with constants a, b, and c that you'd have to solve for. That just gets messy beyond anything we want to deal with in this class. So we'll stop with quadratic factors, but you can imagine how this process would extend to more complicated things if you had quadratic factors with repetition, for instance, or cubic factors or higher powers, things follow a similar pattern, but the details of the algebra get messy beyond anything we want to see. Let me show you one quick example here. If you had something like one over x squared times x plus one times x squared plus four x minus nine, x squared plus four x minus nine doesn't factor. So we need a quadratic piece in our partial fraction decomposition. But notice that the x squared again is not actually a quadratic factor. It's just a linear factor that's repeated. So we would need a term for x and a term for x squared. Then x plus one would get its own partial fraction. And then we would need one more term for that quadratic factor, x squared plus four x minus nine. And the numerator there would have that linear form we're gonna use D and E here as the next unknown letters, but that unknown linear factor would have a term DX plus E over X squared plus four X minus nine. So those are the three cases that you'll need to deal with in this class. Again, there are other possibilities that we will not deal with, but all the problems you'll see will have one of these three forms. The simplest version is if you have all unique linear factors, each one just gets its own fraction. If there's repetition, you have to account for that 
and give a repeated term for each repetition that you need. And then for quadratic ones, you need a linear term to go with it. So with that, we can now write at least the form of the partial fractions. And then the last step will be to solve for those unknown values, A, B, C, etc.